this is Monopoly, and this is a Ouija board. This game kills people, and it's still better than Monopoly. People are terrified of Ouija boards, and for the life of me, I can't understand why. I think that even people who aren't religious find a certain thrill in experiencing something that they can't explain. And it's because of this that people enjoy to place themselves in situations where their emotions will get the better of them, so that they'll eventually fail to accept any insinuation that those experiences could be explained by natural causes. The reason that so many people invested in the paranormal have accepted the numerous pseudosciences about patches of cold air and random whispers in radio static is that when you're actually in that environment, usually an ancient and abandoned building that is eerily quiet yet yet filled with reminders of the past, the certain feeling that is present at the time will always come across to you as evidence itself. And that's why people oh so love and are oh so terrified by this little piece of cardboard. Something so reeking in the occult that you can buy it at Barnes & Noble. The history of the Ouija board honestly comes across as if it's more soaked in trademark disputes than actual blood and gore. The rights to the board are currently owned by Hasbro Incorporated, the same company that owns the rights to G.I. Joe, along many other toy lines. When you take that into account, the existence of these films starts to make sense. Ouija movies are essentially made for the same reason that they keep making Transformers movies, to sell toys. And if you don't believe me, just go ahead and take a gander at the list of producers for the 2014 Ouija film. I get why some people have a predisposition to find Ouija boards terrifying, but to me, it would make just about as much sense to make a horror movie about a magic 8-ball. In fact, I legitimately think that the idea of a demonically possessed magic 8-ball is far more scary than the same story happening with a board game. So let's start off this whole charade with Ouija 2014. Not to be confused with Ouija 2012, Ouija 2010, Ouija 2007, Ouija 2006, Ouija 2003, Ouija 1920, or Waluigi 2020! Ouija 2014 is not a well-regarded movie, and for a very good reason. It's a film that isn't scary, barely manages to make any sense, and yet feels obnoxiously dumbed down. It seems to know that its premise is uninteresting and overplayed, and yet it comes across as extremely pretentious. In short, it's basically a well-produced creepypasta. The movie starts off with the two main characters as children playing with what is an innocent take on the game in question. These characters are Debbie and Lane, who are apparently both huge fans of Ouija and play it all the time. The film then fades to many years later as Debbie has grown up to be a 27-year-old pretending to be a 17-year-old. She has just had a bad encounter with a version of the game that's apparently super, super evil, and she decides to throw it in the fire. Just then, she is called by her childhood best friend, who we also saw in the previous scene, but manages to shoo her away after some light conversation. It feels like this should be like good setup. Like this is definitely giving like a someone's in the house vibe, right? But it's about a board game. The board game is doing laundry. Debbie works her way up the stairs into her bedroom where she's horrified to discover that the game that she's just destroyed is sitting on her bed, waiting to kill her. Pretty spooky until you remember that this is the exact same plot to Sonic.exe. Tis the season to be jolly, fa la 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 The brunette childhood friend meets with her boyfriend at a diner to discuss a potential trip that they might take as a couple. They're joined by their waitress friend, who begins dumping exposition about how they're the perfect couple and everyone's so jealous of them and, and whatnot. None of this is really ever addressed again? In your perfect couple situation. She's gonna die first, I hope. I wanna go back for a second, because none of this is important. That Ouija board appeared on her bed. One of three things happened. Either the ghost brought the Ouija board out of the fire and restored it. The second option is that he just made a new Ouija board appear. The third and final, and personally my favorite option, is that he drove to Toys R Us. <laughs> bought a new one. Snuck in the back door when she wasn't looking and placed it on the bed. <laughs> Lane gets called back to her house by her father and while she expects a stern talking to about something insignificant, she soon learns that something has happened to Debbie. The family soon go to Debbie's house where all of her friends have gathered. When I was reading reviews about this online before I'd been able to get very far into it, pacing issues was a phrase that came up a lot. Now, I usually take a pacing issue to just be when the movie is too fast or too slow, but where Ouija 2014 seems to fail is the concept of representing the passage of time. If you sit down and do the math for when all of these scenes are set, Debbie essentially has to have died Saturday morning, and her wake is being held Saturday evening? 
What? I tried really hard to justify how this wouldn't be the case, but the scenes are right next to each other, and there was no leap in time before this, and there are so many instances in the film where it seems to be confirmed that these two events take place on the same day. Like the idea that they were able to organize some sort of formal party within 12 hours of this girl dying. It's ridiculous! Lane makes her way up the staircase to Debbie's room, still in shock that she's gone. Did they put the lights back? <laughs> <laughs> The fedora's there, I no longer feel bad that she's dead. Debbie's mom finds her there, and they have a rather creepy discussion which is supposed to be endearing. Thank you for watching the house while we're gone. The soup had the, our flight to New York for our vacation. We, we, can't, we can't trade in those tickets, so we have to go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for house sitting for us. It's too bad that we're going on a year long cruise. <laughs> Debbie's mom has gathered up a box of her daughter's belongings that Lane might like to have, and hands it over. Again, how long has it been? Don't you think she would have, like, more important things on her itinerary? This entire sequence ends up feeling very hollow and confusing, and that's mainly because the scene's motivation is merely to set up the situation for which the rest of the film will happen in. The filmmaker's need for this house to be empty, and potentially for it to be empty for a very long time, so the explanation is that Debbie's mom is potentially just abandoning the house and expects Lane to just look over it for the rest of time? Yeah, go, go around, just water the plants and everything, you, you know, clean the pool, you got it and the box of memorabilia is also added just for potential future exposition. Lane's little sister decides to try and sneak out and see a guy late that night, but Lane tries to stop her. Lane, incidentally, is just mercilessly mean to her sister almost the entire movie for no reason other than, I guess, she just needs to take her anger out on someone? Lane's sister snaps back that Lane needs to stop being so uptight. Mom's not around, hasn't been for a while, and you don't need to be her. <laughs> I like to think their mom died like four days before this. So, like in this universe, <laughs> the process of more like there's no realistic time frame for death. Just give Nona a call. No, Nona died this morning. Oh man, yeah, there's a party. They're doing the party right now. The visitation's right now. Right now. She died half an hour ago. She gets dressed. <laughs> so a day later, I presume, Lane and her boyfriend arrive at the house to watch it. Debbie's parents have left town by now, so it's not clear what happened to Debbie's body. Maybe after the wake, they just did the funeral in like 10 minutes. Lane's boyfriend goes around back to try and check on the pool cover, in a scene that lasts a very long time because they're trying to set up how they're going to kill him like a toddler later in the movie. Lane finds the Ouija board that Debbie had been holding on to and begins to reminisce about the past, growing sad that she never had a chance to say goodbye to her lost friend. B. The next day, Lane explains to her friends that she has a plan to try and use the Ouija board to speak to Debbie from beyond the grave. Her friends think it's silly but are willing to go through with it to put her mind at ease. The next day, Lane heads out to the house, but first checks up on her sister Sarah. Sarah? What are you doing, Sarah? Is that rock and or roll? In my Christian household. <laughs> However, upon seeing a car parked outside, she scares it off and tells Sarah that she has to come to Debbie's house because she can't be trusted on her own. With that is that you're a kid and the guy is too old for you. So I'm picking up this vibe here that Sarah is supposed to be like 14, 15. But the thing is, she doesn't look 15, she looks 25. In fact, I looked it up, the actress playing Sarah is actually older than the actress playing Lane. In hindsight, this has been incredibly obvious the entire time, so whenever Lane tries to act like this responsible big sister, and tries to stop Lane from seeing older men, it just comes across as weirdly invasive, because I don't really care that your older little sister is in a relationship you don't like. She's 15, going on 25, you have to let her make her own mistakes. Every actor in this film looks 25, by the way. I keep expecting them to find a bunch of power coins or something. I just want to say, there's like two scenes in this film set inside their school, and it's literally just them talking outside their lockers. Why did they need to be in a high school? Does this really add anything? I honestly feel like the only reason they're playing teenagers is that the filmmakers thought that audiences might not be invested in the suicide of a 30 year old. There's a scene where a counselor tries to comfort Lane about the fact that all of her friends are dying suddenly. And this is like the only scene in the movie where it matters that they're in high school. It's like the filmmakers think that if they dig into our minds and scour together the worst memories of our lives and then do a little marionette puppet show of those moments, that we won't be able to notice that the movie is stupid and terrible. But instead of feeling personally touched, I feel kind of insulted. So everyone goes to Debbie's house to try and contact her from beyond the grave. Doesn't this feel like Grave Encounters too? You know? I get the cameras. <laughs> 
we're gonna make the best ghost show ever. They play with the Ouija board and surprise, surprise, it starts responding to their questions. A lot of these special effects are practical, meaning that they actually had to be done in real time while they were filming. So in other words, you can tell who is pushing the piece and who is pulling the piece based around how their fingers react to the piece. The Ouija board spells out Hi Friend, which seems like nothing special in that moment, but as soon as they finish using the board, the power in the house goes off and they find distinct hints of a presence in the home. Lane's housekeeper Nona is cleaning her room the next day and finds the Ouija board and warns of the evils that it might bring. Early on in the movie, Nona is just a supportive figure and it's not immediately clear why she's in the movie, but around this point it starts to become obvious that her role is to be the person who believes in Ouija boards and apparently knows everything about the occult. It's a little amusing because it's obvious that she was cast in the role, because if you had a white person saying all of these same things, audiences wouldn't take them seriously. But because she's Hispanic, we're meant to presume that anything she says about messing with the dead is super serious and intense and trustable. And not crazy. I couldn't sleep last night. I had all these weird dreams. Then you could sleep last night. Throughout the next day, each person who had been at the seance has a supernatural experience wherein they witness the phrase, Hi Friend, written out in public. Fuck off, that's ridiculous. Here's the thing about the supernatural horror genre. These films have to constantly tight walk between two ideas. Of showing so little that it might come across as the main characters making it all up, or showing so much that it comes across as fake and pulls the audience out of the experience. Some of the best horror films ever made have towed this line so closely that many are still not sure if the movies are actually about hauntings or not. And the reason that this tends to be how these films need to be made is that audiences are so desensitized by the countless examples of hoax videos online that anytime a movie chooses to illustrate a spirit as a person in makeup, we immediately don't buy into it. I associate a person playing a ghost towards the process of making a movie and that takes me out of the experience of watching the movie itself. And when it gets to the point that we are being shown what is obviously a literal human hand being pushed against the glass of a car door window, then there is no part of our brain that chooses to view that as an actual ghost. One thing that the movie keeps trying to do to acknowledge this is to attempt to be sort of meta by pointing out that Ouija boards aren't scary, or on other occasions doing sort of fake out jump scares. The thing is that all these moments really do is set out to us that our expectations for this genre are all kind of hokey and silly, but instead of rectifying this by showing us a better way to make the film, it then does all of those same ideas, but this time they're meant to be serious. When one of the characters points out that Ouija boards are just stupid party tricks, or when a jump scare turns out to be a jogger or a shopping cart, it doesn't make me more surprised when the Ouija board turns out to actually work, or when we're expected to be scared by a real jump scare. Instead, it makes me value this universe and the writing significantly less. I just don't see how one shot of an actress suddenly appearing isn't supposed to be scary, but another one is. The elite throughout history, and especially in modern times, you think it would be less, are obsessed with the occult and believe they're deriving their power from the occult. I mean, both George Bush, his dad, um, so many others like uh, John Kerry, believe that they are possessed by Dark Angels. While walking to school from the bus, the group discusses these events, and they decide to go back to the house to try the board again. It's during this session that they find out that the ghost that they've been talking to isn't Debbie, but is some other ghost. It's then that Lane remembers that if she looks through the piece, she'll be able to see any ghosts that are in the area which leads to her seeing the ghost of a small blonde child with her mouth bound together, and of an angry mother coming towards the table. They freak out and run away, and decide to stay out of the whole affair from here on out. While going through Debbie's videos, Lane finds a series of insultingly convenient vlogs Debbie has done about cleaning the attic over her bedroom. It's there that we find out that the Ouija board came from the attic itself, meaning that it was the property of a previous owner of the house. Meanwhile, the girl from earlier who I wanted to die first, is getting ready to take a bath when she finds that her lips are suddenly stitched together and she is swiftly possessed by one of the ghosts. The ghost then lifts her up and slams her head into the sink, killing her, presumably just as the image of a flux capacitor flutters across her subconscious. Hoping it will help them figure things out before another one of them dies, Lane and this guy who look like the guy who's meant to look like Harrison Ford decide to go back into the house so that they can go hunting for attic clues. So in that vlog that Debbie shot, she says that she went up to the attic to clean it, and uh... 
She did a pretty shit job, didn't she? Lane finds enough to search through an online newspaper database for information about the family. It turns out that in 1951, one of the daughters of a woman who had lived in this house went missing, and the police suspected that she had actually killed her. They find out that the sister of the missing girl is still alive, and Lane goes to meet with her. So from what I've read, originally the movie didn't have this part in it, but test audiences couldn't understand the plot, so they invented a character who could explain the plot in a really upfront and bizarre tone. Even with this character added in, the plot still doesn't make sense. And then something went wrong with Mother. Chasing the dead and living in all those shadows, something snapped, she couldn't turn it off. I really cannot put into words how much I hate this character. There's something so unfun about choosing to explore a plot point like this. And it really raises so many questions. Like, she basically tells Lane where the mother had hidden the body. But how could this possibly be the first time she's ever told anyone? In the past 50 years, if the police were rightfully convinced that the mother had killed the missing daughter, then how would an easy-to-reach part of the building not be found after all this time? When they go to find this hidden room, all I could think is that if I were to buy a house like this, this would be the first place that I would find. The old lady tells Lane that she needs to cut the wires holding the dead girl's lips together because Mother had been the one killing everyone and only the dead daughter can stop her. And while she's trying to cut the wires, the ghost mom tries to stop her, but then she does it in time, and the ghost kid kills the ghost mom, which is apparently a thing that ghosts can do to each other. Everyone goes home thinking that the movie is over, but the Han Solo one ends up seeing the kid ghost and he gets possessed as well. And we're told that he died, although we're never told how, so just use your imagination there. Lane goes back to the old lady, saying that the mother must have lived, as a ghost I mean, because one of her other friends died. And the old lady reveals that it was actually the daughter doing the killings the entire time, and that now she's free. Free from... what? Do you mean the stitches, or the mom ghost? Because either way, it seems like if she was killing people before and now she's killing people again, then not much has changed. I mean, at most, she's probably got, like, less of a nag around. But it hardly seems like something to dedicate such a huge chunk of the movie to. They finally go and talk to Nona about this, and she goes on some sort of long rant that is supposed to not sound insane. It sounds pretty insane. Basically, in order to stop this ghost, they need to burn the board and the body at the same time. They all head to the house, and the boyfriend character gets there first and is lured behind the house by the sister. Except it's not the sister, it's the ghost. The ghost apparently now has the same powers as the second Terminator. The ghost throws him into the pool and he gets caught in the pool cover and drowns. A noble end indeed. The two sisters go to the basement without him, where the youngest one gets sucked in. And it's here that she meets the ghost head on. The ghost is now this decaying thing with a hook? I thought the ghost could look like anything. Some of you might expect to find out that this is actually her real body come back to life. But the body is a different thing in the scene. So is this a third copy of her? Is this what they unleashed by cutting her lips? No one knows. The ghost is going to kill Sarah, but Lane starts playing with the Ouija board, and apparently that means the ghost has to come through and play it with her. They set up some rules about playing the Ouija board in the first scene, but I was under the impression that that version of the game in the scene wasn't real, so I don't get why a random ghost would adhere to these rules. The ghost grabs Lane's arm and begins to twist it to an unnatural angle, and as this happens, her eyes slowly grow white as she is possessed. But at the very last minute, another arm joins in and Lane is freed. <laughs> Fuck you! Go fuck yourself. Fuck you! That's right, ladies and gentlemen, that the power of friendship overpowers the concept of death, and, uh, and Debbie saves the day and, and stops the evil ghost. It also helps that they throw her body into a furnace. Alright, so I guess, I guess you guys did it, but, uh, don't come crying to me if the police end up finding a, a burned up dead child in your furnace. <laughs> The two sisters go home, apparently without the consequences of their friends being dead bearing down too hard on their lives. But when she goes to her room, Lane finds the only piece of the Ouija board that they forgot to destroy. And she looks through the viewfinder. Cut to black. What was that supposed to imply? I don't know. One of them's... I don't... Caleb, fuck this movie. It made 103.6 million? Why? Caleb, this movie cost 5 million to, pr to make. No, it did not. And that sounds like a lot, but the room costs more than that. I'm not tired. Like, I could stay up for... I'm not tired physically, but emotionally, I, I'm, like, drained. Ouija 2014 is a mess, and it's hard to say exactly why that is, because even trying to figure out what they were going for is next to impossible. 
A big issue to me is that the characters seem to be defined by no noteworthy traits or dynamics. There's a lot of setup in the opening scenes in terms of the general relationships, but by the end the only thing that's really been explored is that they were all friends and now some of them are dead. It's not like we're really exploring the emotional depths of this situation past Debbie. Hell, when you really get down to it, it's super easy to forget that Lane and this guy were dating the entire movie because other than like one scene, there's no indication that they are in a relationship, and arguably his death is the one that affects her the least. These characters are so similar that I would occasionally lose track of how many of them had died so far, and the waitress in particular continued to leave me confused as to why she had been featured in the movie. In terms of the plot, I suppose I'm at a minor disposition, in that I'm not entirely a huge fan of horror films or movies about ghosts, but I found the entire plotline surrounding the hauntings in this film to be tedious and confusing. And the more that the film chose to show these ghosts as fully formed physical beings who just occasionally teleport into shot, the less I was able to hold on to any suspension of disbelief. By the middle of the film, it was hard to believe that the characters wouldn't have gone to any sort of authority by then. I know they're high schoolers and the movie is about ghosts, and in the real world you wouldn't tell anyone about this stuff because no one would believe you, but that's because ghosts aren't real, and there's never been any event that's proven that ghosts exist. But the thing is, in this film, numerous events take place that make the existence of ghosts seem demonstrably provable. Within the confines of this universe, it apparently seems super easy to prove that ghosts exist, to the point that people like Nona understand the functioning nature of the occult down to a science. And personally, even if ghosts do exist, the idea that they would adhere to the nature of superstition is just hilarious to me. The ghost goes around killing people and taking over random people's bodies, but if you play a board game by yourself, they have to stop and come see you! And really, this just circles back around to what has always been the main tier issue with this film. That being that Ouija boards, no matter how unique or varnished they look, will always be the campiest things on Earth. And no matter how many times Hasbro tries to license them, you will never be able to change my mind on that subject matter. I ended up deciding to split this video into at least two parts, uh, partially because that made the video easier to make, and also, additionally, I know for a fact that it makes the video easier to watch. Uh, so if you come back in a few weeks, I'll potentially have a part two up discussing other Ouija films. And with that, I realize that this obviously isn't all you need, but nevertheless, thank you so much for being here. How many times have we ended something with, I don't know, I mean, fuck, kill, fuck this boy, that's like our thing now. <laughs>